Hello and welcome to another episode of Data Lounge where we take a little bit more relaxed and fun approach to data. Uh, we're very excited today because we have an absolute rock star with us. So uh, we have with us today Paul Andrew. Paul, welcome to Data Lounge. Thank you. Thank How are you doing me. today? Good. I, I'm now embarrassed by this uh, <laughs> intro. <laughs> Good. So Paul, what, what are we going to be talking about today? Azure Data Factory, okay. my favorite topic. Um, not so much about the service itself, but mm -hmm. I want to show our audience how we actually deploy Data Factory using DevOps, using the tools that we get out of the box. Okay, perfect. So let's get started. And I think definitely this is something really interesting because uh, many of uh, the, the sessions that we might see online or in other places are really focused a lot on the development with Data uh, Factory now, with Natural yeah. Data Factory version 2. Uh, but the manageability, and when we're talking about really enterprise environments, uh, one of the most important elements is how do we really manage this code at the end of the day? Yeah. Uh, I think that's, that's very interesting. Yeah, we can develop these services, but it's getting it into production that is generally the hard part. So I want to show you how we can do that with Data Factory. Brilliant, excellent, let's get started. Okay, so if I jump to my very brief set of slides, firstly, I, I wanna give you a, a quick overview of Azure Data Factory, just in case there's anybody out there that's not actually seen the service yet. So really quick uh, intro to Data Factory. And if we ask the question, what is Data Factory? And, and for me, the, the context of this is if we look at some process we have in Azure, some process that we want where we need to get our data from A to B to C, whatever. Data Factory will sit there as the, the orchestrator, as the umbrella service that mm -hmm. will go and invoke these services and it will make this process happen. Now, I like to think of Data Factory as the boss. It will go there, it will sit above it, it will manage, monitor, schedule, and as I say, it doesn't do the, the work itself, it will go and invoke these services to do its bidding for it. I like to think of Data Factory as my wife. It will okay. sit there being the boss, <laughs> and I am all the other Azure services doing the work. It's the, the simplest way to, I like to remember it. Brilliant. Yeah. So. <laughs> Let's go a little deeper into our data factory and look at the components we actually need to orchestrate this process. So we have five of them. Firstly, this idea of a link service. So if you've ever used SSIS and the connection manager we have within SSIS, we can think of our link services as a lot like the connection manager. They are the bits of information Data Factory needs to authenticate against our other Azure services. Okay. In the case of a SQL DB, we might have the host name, the username, the password, whatever. The, the information Data Factory needs to authenticate is number one. Number two is this idea of a data set. Now this isn't the actual data itself, but more a, a metadata representation of where Data Factory needs to go to get the data we want to work with. So in the case of a SQL database, again, the data set number two might contain information of the schema, the table name, the mm -hmm. attributes, the, the data types within there, and that data set will authenticate using a link service. So those are the first two. Number three is this thing called an activity. So I say Data Factory is quite bossy, it will go and invoke these other services we have in Azure. That activity is the information tailored to the service that it's going to go and invoke. And like our data sets, those activities will authenticate with the link services again. So quick example in the case of a Databricks notebook, if we want Data Factory to call that, we will have an activity that contains the Databricks instance we want to talk to, the workspace of the notebook, the parameters we want to pass, the libraries we want to use, information for the service we're going to invoke. 
Then number four is this idea of a pipeline. Mm -hmm. Now we could say this whole process is our data pipeline, which okay. is fine in that context, but also a pipeline is a component of our data factory. And we can use these pipelines to group together our activities, one or many activities, it doesn't matter. And those logical groupings of activities can allow us to break apart to control our data factory. We can call one pipeline from another. So we have that flexibility. So that's number four, our pipelines. Pipelines will contain our activities, number three. Activities will have our input and output data sets, number two. And as I've said, two and three will authenticate with our link services. Then lastly, number five is a trigger. We attach a trigger to a pipeline or many pipelines and it allows Data Factory to know when we want the thing to run. This could be scheduled with a very sort of recursive window, very similar to what we had with our SQL Server agent on yep. premises. We'll have that sort of recursive schedule. We can have tumbling windows, which will detect, uh, sorry, for time series data, or if we want to use that option that like we had in Data Factory V1. Mm -hmm. We have the ability to trigger them when files are dropped in blob storage. So Data Factory will subscribe to that event, trigger a pipeline based on that. We can do all sorts of other things as well to, to trigger our pipelines. So that's number five. So those are our five components of our data factory that we need. And if we say data factory is an, an orchestrator, its hymn sheet for okay. its orchestration will be JSON. It needs that JSON information to tell it what to do. Every component will be built up in JSON. So that's our quick intro to data factory. If we now turn our attention to actually DevOps, continuous integration, continuous delivery, as I say, how do we get this thing deployed? And if we start with the developer experience, mm -hmm. Data Factory uses the Azure portal and it has its own then development environment that we go to from the portal and each developer will use this browser-based experience. Sadly, we cannot develop Data Factory on a plane or a train because <laughs> we need that internet connection, we need that, that browser. So probably one of the, of the initial elements to consider here is that unlike other components within, within a traditional Azure data stack mm. or data platform, with Data Factory, all the development needs actually to happen online, correct? Correct, yeah. Okay. Unless, of course, you want to hand crank that JSON in Notepad or something. <laughs> in, um, in Visual yeah. Notepad, okay, yeah, good. Yeah. But no, if we want to use the, the developer experience via the portal, it's a very rich graphical experience, as I'll mm -hmm. show you in a moment. That's okay. where your developers need to go. Now, um, that's the developer experience, firstly, just on the left-hand side there. But then if we want to think about publishing that data factory or deploying that data factory, we need to think about what options we've got for that. And I've kind of alluded to one option here on this slide. But if we sort of go into that a little more and, and think about that, and we can actually park that, and what I'm going to say is that with this experience, with one data factory, we can have, have our developers working in this debug environment. Mm -hmm. Data factory will give you this development, this debug area out of the box that we can okay. use. And then with that one data factory, we can create our pipelines, our, our components, and we can publish. So with that one data factory, we hit publish, the code that we've created can go to the service, it can be deployed. And with that one data factory, we could say that we have that dev environment and that prod environment, and we get that separation. So that's okay. possible. But I'll call that option one. Okay. Deployment using a single data factory. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, in some enterprise environments, we might not want to do that. So what I'm also going to introduce is option two. Wow, that, that looks way more complex right now. It is, yeah. But if we have a dev environment, mm -hmm. a test environment, UAT, production, you know, whatever we want to call these environments, and then we have a data factory per environment, and we have that separation, we can't just use one data factory like we okay. had in, in our option one at the top. So what we need to then do in option two is consider actually taking those ARM templates from our development environment and then via some mechanism publishing that data factory into test, into live, right. into, into whatever. So in this slide I've got that sort of option one and option two. 
Okay. So what I'd like to do then now is actually just talk about the option one experience. Perfect. Let's, let's take a look at that. So what I have in my Azure portal is firstly a whole bunch of data factories. Now, if I want to create a new data factory, mm -hmm. just straight off the bat, I just want to show you this experience. It changed recently. Now we enter the name of our data factory, the Azure subscription, we want to use the resource group, the usual things. But what we also now have is the ability, as you'll see here, to enable Git. And we can specify the credentials, the bits of information for our Git repo right at deployment time. Okay. Now, I always forget to do that. I always forget what those bits are. So I actually always untick yeah, that it. box and I will create my data factory and allow it to do the deployment. Now that takes a, a few moments. So what I've done is I've deployed a vanilla data factory just to show you what we get from the very start. So within data factory or Paul's fun factory number three, it's definitely fun. Good. <laughs> so in Paul's fun factory number three, it loads this separate browser experience. And what we see from the start is this option to set up the code repository. Okay. So this is what I always do. I always click this because I never do it at deployment time. Now, in this drop down, as you can see, we have two options here either to use GitHub mm -hmm. or to use Azure DevOps and a Git repo. I'm just going to click GitHub and I'm just going to put in Mr. Paul Andrew, mm -hmm. the name of my. Git repo, and you'll see that it will prompt yeah. me to authenticate with GitHub, which is very nice. Okay. So it's it's native integration right now between Azure Data Factory environment and GitHub itself. Yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect. But it's that authentication that I really want to talk about because with GitHub, it's mm -hmm. got that dedicated authentication, which and it, it prompts us to do that. Okay. If I switch to Azure DevOps and Git, now I'm fortunate because it will recognize that I have an Azure DevOps environment. It recognizes I've got that. Okay. And when we're in this series of browser windows, it's relying on that authentication and making sure that my Azure portal, my data factory, my DevOps environment, all are using the same credentials. Okay. Now in an enterprise environment, that might not be the case. Yeah. So if you don't have all these things lined up in the same tenant, you might have an authentication issue here when it comes to connect your data factory to Azure DevOps. Mm -hmm. So if you experience that, you might have to get creative with switching your, your MSDN alt account or, or doing something different. Or okay. So that's a, just a, a first challenge to call out. So I'm all right, I'm okay. I can select my DevOps and I can just choose a, a project if I wanted to. I can say create me a new repo or use an existing one. And once selected those things, I can apply and then I've got that link between my data factory and my Git repo. One of the things I'm noticing here, uh, Paul, is that the integration either with GitHub or uh, with Azure DevOps is Git based. Yes. Right? So we don't have, at least not yet, uh, but we don't seem to have the more traditional a TFS centralized uh, repository no. experience, right? No, there's no okay. there's no source safe 2005. There is no anymore. source safe 2005. Okay, perfect. <laughs> no, yeah, it's it's Git based. So that's how we configure that connection to a repository in a vanilla data factory. Okay. Now I've done that already for uh, an alternative fun factory just to to make our life uh, easier while I show you this. So I'm going to go now into fun factory number two. I'm going to go author and deploy again. And once this loads, it's very interesting to note that the, the, you you are not tied to have to do the full setup from the beginning, no. right? I mean, you can, you, and, and you just showed uh, that to us. You were able to say at the beginning, uh, no, I'm just going to create something quick. You don't have to. If it's a tiny project or you're just mm. learning about data factor, you don't have to enable all the Git. Uh, integration, source control integration, but if you start and then it, begun, it, it begins to, to turn into something more serious, then you can actually say, you know what, I'm going to enable it, now it's getting serious, now we need formal processes in place, yeah. you can enable it later on. Of course, yeah, absolutely. So you can still work with Data Factory without this. Mm -hmm. I'm just showing you the experience if, if you want to, yeah. So in Fun Factory number two, 
Um, you can see I don't have that setup icon yep. anymore. I have my Git settings that are already there, and this is, this is already working fine. So then if I turn my attention to authoring Data Factory with a, the little pencil icon on the left, and I look at some pipelines I've already got created, I've got a very, very simple pipeline. I think this is probably the, the most simple pipeline we, we could create. And this has got a single activity, a wait activity, okay. and this is going to wait for five seconds. So I've already created this just for ease. But um, what you'll notice here is that because I'm connected to my Git repo, I have options here about branching, and it's telling me that I'm using the master branch currently. Okay. You'll also see on the top left this drop down that allows me to switch between the Git version of my data factory yes. and this other one which is just called data factory. That is the published version of the service that exists. Okay. So it's important to make that distinction. When we talk about option one of deployment, data factory is potentially the live service yes. in that option one. And then the Git is potentially our development environment. Okay. With this one data factory. So with my pipeline here, if I want to work on it or change it, so I can then do things here and I can hit debug. So within this browser environment, I can, as the, the button suggests, debug and, and work on my data factory without needing to do a, a great deal. Okay. I can set breakpoints on my activities and it will give us this output panel at the bottom of what that data factory is actually doing. Now, of course, this is only waiting five seconds, so mm -hmm. that succeeded. We're all good. We can see the information about what happened there. Now, that's nice, mm -hmm. but you know, let's think about that in the context of our source control, in the context of our, our Git repo. So what um, you'll see is on the top right-hand side now, if I want to look at the code for this pipeline, we can see this little bit of JSON, the instructions for our data factory. We can see this array of activities, and we can see my weight, and we can get to everything that we need if we want to. Okay, so this is the JSON that um, we were referring to before, right? When you were yeah. saying that the, the way everything is described is via a dot JSON flavor. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's all JSON. So that's the code if we want to look at it in this environment. If I want to just switch to my Azure DevOps environment mm -hmm. and I've got my data factories project and within here the repositories and the repository for my fun factory. So we can see that because I've created this at the root of the repository, what I've got here is a subfolder for every component within my data factory. Okay. And if I go to pipeline, I can then also get to that same JSON via DevOps and looking at this via this uh, repo as well, if I wish. This, this folder structure, um, was this created by Data Factory the moment you linked it, or did we have to go manually and create each no, folder on its own? Uh, Data Factory creates all this for us. Okay. It, it understands its own components. It will create the structure for you. So, so yeah, taken care of. Okay, great. Um, of course, in a, another environment, we might have a, a higher level folder for our data factory and, and our other solutions and things in there. But yeah, this is created for us. Okay. So that's the JSON for my pipeline via DevOps. Now, what I want to show you is that if I just look at the history of this JSON file, mm -hmm. you'll see that an hour or so ago, I made some changes to this when I was playing around. Okay. If I go back to my data factory area again, and I'm just going to increase my weight from five seconds to 10 seconds. And you'll notice that I've got a little asterisk on yes. that pipeline now. So this pipeline we could consider is dirty. It's changed, yes. obviously. Now, if I hit save on that pipeline, because I'm making a change to it, what actually happens behind the scenes is data factory is doing a commit and a push to my data factory. As okay part of just hitting that save. So, you know, all that sort of adding descriptions and things we, and that commit operation, it's all taken away from us just with that save icon in the portal. And, and it's very interesting because um, when, when we are developing in Data Factory without mm. the source control concept on, yeah. on, 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 on our environment, you don't see a save button. You see a publish one when you see that as star there that says, yeah. hey, dirty code. 
uh, and you actually don't don't see a safe option. So yeah. here we're actually getting the full, hey, you can save to a safe place first yeah. before you deciding to actually put the code in, in, in production. Yeah, it's just a very different experience to okay. what we might have via Visual Studio if yeah. we had that Team Explorer panel and, yeah. and that sort of process there, it's, it's taken away from us. So having saved that and having done that commit, if I just drop back to DevOps and I just refresh on this, what we should see in the history of my pipeline is, yes, a minute ago, I made a change, change to this and very simplistic, five seconds updated to 10 seconds. And it's great that it's in, in JSON because it definitely al allows us from, from more of a management mm. control, right? That process of blame as it is, as it, as it is, as it is known, which I don't like calling it blame, is actually finding out how, how the, the code actually changed. Mm. It's a very straightforward process. At the end of the day, it's just a, a text comparison, which compared to the things that we used to have in integration services back yeah. in the day, it was the massive XML yeah. describing all that structure. So yeah. this is definitely, it looks like cleaner, like more straightforward to find yeah. out what actually changed. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's readable ultimately, and we can see it directly in the, the source code. So that's what that data factory is doing. That, that's what that pipeline is doing. I've okay. debugged it, I've saved it, I've made changes, that's fine. But I've been doing it against the master branch. You know, okay. So slap wrist. Yes. We shouldn't be doing that. So what I can do is, because I'm a good developer, uh -huh. is I can go into here, I can actually create a new branch if I want. Okay. And I'm just going to call this new branch demo. We would have a, a better naming convention better name. for our branches. Definitely. Yes. We would have Definitely. feature branches. We don't have this in production. No one has a branch called my branch one, two, three. No one has something no. like that. No. So what I've done is now I've created that new branch mm -hmm. and Data Factory has automatically switched all of my environments to that new branch. Okay. So as a developer, I could come in, I could work on my own branch, I could debug my pipelines in my own branch and I'm isolated as, you know, this is, this is nice. So maybe now I actually change my weight again. I now up it from mm -hmm. 10 seconds to 15 seconds. No big deal. Okay. I hit save and it will write to my Git repo and we can see in our Git repo, we have my demo branch created. We have all the okay. things we expect. You know, this, this is as we, we want it. Now though, if I actually want to think about publishing my work, so yes. I say we have this one data factory and we have that separation there between the, the Git repo and the data factory service. Mm -hmm. So now if I actually hit publish, I'm going to be presented with this message. We are okay. not allowed to publish our data factory unless it is using the master branch. Okay. So this is where we need to be careful perhaps that our developers, although they can work in their own branches, mm -hmm. they will have to do a pull request, bring okay. things back to master before we deploy. Okay. So let's just show that experience. I can go to my drop down again, create pull request, it's nice that I've got that seamless integration with Git and of course my, my authentication allows this. Mm -hmm. I can create my pull request. Maybe in our wider team we get somebody to peer mm -hmm. review it yes. and approve it and, and you know all those good processes. And, and we didn't have to do anything uh, like going separately to Azure DevOps from a scratch. By just saying create the pull request yeah. from within the UE of Data Factory. Mm. Now it's simply because everything is linked, it just yeah. says, okay, yeah, I know where you are, go create a pull request. That's yeah. it. That's it, yeah. Okay. So I can complete my pull request because I approve my own code all the yes, time. Yes, of course. <laughs> of course. Um, I can then drop that, and then if I just hit refresh on my Data Factory, it will know that that branch has been deleted. Yep. Yeah. So it says no longer exists. Let's switch back to master. Yes, please. So now in master, that code merge has happened. My wait activity here is now up to 15 seconds as we expected. Good. And then if I just quickly look at my deployed data factory, just to understand yes. what's already there in the service. Yeah. I see my wait activity, this one is set to 60 seconds. So, you know, we haven't done a publish maybe for a while. We've been debugging, we've been working yes. separately. So I can drop back to the Git version. 
And now I'm in that master branch, so now I can hit publish. Okay. It will, as the, the pop-up suggests, looking at the changes, figuring out what's happened. There is a difference between mm -hmm. my waiting pipeline, are we sure we want to accept? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. So it will now go and actually publish that data factory to that service for me. Okay, is this still doing the validation of whether everything makes sense before doing that publish, like the one that it does when we're not in, in Git? Yes, it should validate the data factory to make okay. sure all the, the attributes, the mandatory ones that have got the little red asterisk against yes. them in the activities, all of those values will need to be populated. Yeah. Whether they're the right values or, or not, not is uh, It's a different story, but, different but at story. least from a schema point of view, validity yeah. of the code, it's doing it the same as well. Yeah, absolutely. Good. So that's published my data factory, just to prove this has happened. I jump in here and we can look at the settings, 15 seconds for my wait activity now in that published service. So that's fine. Now, the other things to call out here, just kind of to wrap up for, for anybody that tries this out, mm -hmm. is that you may have also noticed that on our toolbar, we have this ability to export an ARM template for our data factory. Yes. That will give us the ARM template for all of that JSON, all wrapped up in a, you know, two files, and it will have an awareness of those dependencies within our, our data factory JSON, which is nice. But what we may also find is that within our DevOps environment, and you may have already seen this earlier, is that I had my master branch, I had my demo branch. We yeah. also have this branch called ADF underscore publish. Yes. So this is a branch that Data Factory goes away and creates on its own that it uses to then do that movement of code from the development environment to the live service. Okay. And what you'll find is if you actually inspect the files of this branch is that we do also have an alternative ARM template for factory, as it's called. Okay. Now this is not the same ARM template that you will deploy. It's, it's not the same one that it's you get from, from the graphical user interface? No. no. So okay. just be careful that when you're looking at the ARM template you export here, yes. that's not actually the same ARM template data factory uses oh. when it does that publish. Okay. You know, it will hopefully achieve the same behavior, yeah. but it may be structured slightly differently. We have this notion of these partial ARM templates in that published branch. So just be careful of that and, and just be mindful. And also, if you have maybe a, a somebody that's methodical about their branching strategy, yes. they might go, what's this ADF yeah. underscore published Yeah, branch? because yeah. it does, it does uh, yeah, it does, I, I thought it was part of the code that you had already prepared, no. but it's actually done by Data Factory itself. Yeah, so just just be aware of that. Just be aware of what that's doing and okay. why it's there. Don't try and delete it. Don't try and do a pull request for it. It's it's there purely. That's for internally. Data that's system yeah. code, basically. Absolutely, yeah. It's, okay. it's it's what Data Factory uses. So hopefully, just to wrap up and maybe just to you know draw attention back to this slide, what we've mm -hmm. gone through there is very much what a developer can expect from Data Factory option one. We have that experience via the portal. We have that Git integration. We have that capability of branching. Mm -hmm. And then we also have this debug and this potential publish option all via that data factory UI. Probably one of the, of the most interesting things that I have learned here in this session is that when we are working without source control in mind, you're like forced to actually work with the live Mm. service, right? You have yeah. to validate, publish, yes or yes, and good luck trying not to make mistakes in your own code, yeah. right? But when we have uh, Git integration, either with GitHub or with Azure DevOps, it's already giving you a lot of space as a developer to actually you test your code, debug your code mm. as you should without actually destroying or affecting the code that might already have been have been deployed, and it's giving you actually all the all the power of Azure DevOps, on yeah. it, right? As as we saw with the ability to to do a div, with the ability to understand the changes, creating the pull requests um, in in an integrated fashion. So I think this is this this has been quite quite interesting. Mm. Yeah, this is the current experience, and maybe later we'll talk about how we do option two as well. Fantastic, excellent. So thank you very much, Paul, for joining us uh, on this on this episode. Very exciting, very interesting when we uh, move beyond the, hey, it's a nice new tool into more of the reality of, of real life enterprise development. Um, thank you, all of you watching this, whatever time it is, in the day, in the night, 
Thank you for joining us in this episode and looking forward to see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye.